Even somewhere you find that they must look like the same. Not necessarily uh, tribal or regional. Welcome back. This is Daybreak on Trust TV, reaching you from Abuja, the nation's capital. It's time for us to take a look at the dailies on Daybreak, and we will begin with the Daily Trust newspaper, as always, where we have the lead story here talking about the inflation rate in the country. It says, tough time for families as inflation soars to seven-year high. With the riders, food beyond reach, says citizens. Kwara, Lagos, Kogi was hit. Zamfara, Sokoto, Borno list. Uh, you also have the analysis there on uh, all the analysis there uh, on page four. Then other riders on the story. Women begin strike in Taraba. Figures not reflection of reality, according to experts. Now you also have other stories above the lead story. Uh, Access Bank eyes more deals after buying Standard Chartered assets on page 19. And Miefele, Arewa leader in South, wife detained by DSS, relatives protest. All that on page six. Carry takes over as acting APC chairman on page 10. And also NGX Group to fast track NNPC listing uh, GT Bank named best in Nigeria by Euro Money four days after NDLAA fails to produce killer of two-year-old boy in Delta on page 16. And then you have lastly, uh, Inugu threatens to revoke license of traders observing sit at home. These are the main stories on Daily Trust cover page. Now let's take a look at the Punch newspaper. It has a late story that says, Audit report Nils Adamo Omishore as Tinubu governor's shop for new chair. And the first writer says, Aggrieved NWC members welcome Adamo's removal. We have neck meeting postponed indefinitely. And the second writer, Carry Fuente take temporary charge, new leaders to emerge at emergency convention. Uh, beneath the Pictorial, we have Army intercepts Anambra-bound truck with ammunition. The Pictorial is actually of the items that were seized. Bene beneath that, we have poultry farmers shutting down over high maize price. We also have lover, prophet to die by hanging for killing Lasso undergraduate. Suspended EFCC chair spends 33 days in custody. And just above the masthead, we have federal government grants 56 import licenses as fuel consumption drops. Anthrax, government plans nationwide animal vaccination. And we also have a story here that says, politicians flooding government house distracting me. This is from the Aquaibom state governor. These are the major stories on the Punch newspaper for today. All right. Now, let's take a look at the Guardian newspaper this morning. The Guardian leads with the story that says, Nigeria spends over 99% of revenue to service debts as inflation bites harder. Uh, sit at home, businesses, schools open in Enugu as Mba vows to seal locked businesses. Uh, you also have APC chieftains explain why Adamu was removed as progressives uh, take over. Uh, you also have fresh concerns over cancerous uh, sweetener in food and beverages. Next story, Amcon Mall's liquidation, return to shareholders, options for embattled Arik Air. Also, PDP, LP, knock APC over alleged plot to intimidate PEPC. Uh, Nigeria confirms first anthrax case among animals in Suleja. So these are the main stories on The Guardian this morning. Now let's take a look at the Vanguard newspaper. The lead story says, our weapons against insecurity, this is from the service chiefs, and we have the CDS saying, I will prioritize uh, troops' welfare, deepen interagency collaboration, make armed forces people-centric. And we also have Nigeria Army most misunderstood, this is according to the chief of Army staff, recommends establishment of the first space force to tackle cybercrime. And above the masthead, we have Emefiele, lawyers initiate contempt case against DSS DG Bichi. 
Deregulation marketers begin foil importation. We also have FRSC can only operate on federal roads, appeal court rules. Beneath that, Army intercepts truckload of ammunition in Southeast. Above that, we have Naira depreciation, subsidy removal push inflation to 22.79%. Beneath the Victoria, we have APC crisis, Tinibu shops for Adamu's successor. We also have NAS committees, lawmakers scramble for Tinibu Baja's endorsement. Also, we have federal government moves to evacuate overtime cargoes from ports. These are the major stories on the Vanguard newspaper for today. All right, now for perspectives on some of the stories we have in the studio, Dr. Teofilos Abba, the director, Daily Trust Foundation, here to give us uh, some analysis. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, let's start with the lead story on the Daily Trust newspaper, where it says, tough time for families as inflation soars to 7 year high. We are talking 22.8%. Uh, but experts are arguing this. They said that this is not a true reflection of the reality. What's your take? Well, um, I think if you talk about um, statistics, you know, by the time you talk about 22.9% inflation rate, um, and you, you notice that the food inflation may be higher, you know, maybe more than 22%. I think I've checked the NBS statistics previously. And in some cases, food inflation may be around 30 something percent, you know, year on year, or month on month on month uh, analysis. And so when you now talk about uh, 20, I mean, maybe uh, 20 something percent, it's not the reality of uh, what is on ground. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if you bought, I mean, rice for uh, let's say 30,000, 35,000 uh, in the month of, of, uh, of June, and you are buying it at 40,000 in the month of, uh, of July, you know, then you cannot say the percentage is just 2%. Because the, the, the marginal increase, month to month to month, is about 2 something percent. So it's not, if you bought at 37, I mean 35,000 in, in, uh, in May, and you bought at 40,000. In June, you cannot say it's two percent, and then the, the the fact is, you see, the increase in fuel price. Although we we'll we we'll talk, we we'll say it's subsidy removal. The the effect is not only on transportation. The effect is all around. If you increase the fuel price, the movement of uh, food, I mean items from rural areas to markets, the price will also, will also go up. Even the young men who work on farms, the laborers. But, but people are arguing that why should it be that we have this uh, impact on food? Because uh, they argue that food is not transported with vehicles car using fuel. It, it's using uh, petrol. I mean, diesel. sorry, diesel, not mm -hmm. uh, petrol, right? So why should it also impact in that regard? Because the farmers have to factor in um, what they will spend in the after selling the food items. For instance, um, let's look at yam. You know, yam that we consume in Abuja, we get from Niger State the most. If the cost of transporting yam from Niger State to Abuja goes up, then it has gone up, then the farmer will have to say, okay, I have to increase the, the price of my yam. You know, so if you used to buy, let's say, I think they, 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 they arrange them in 10 tubers. You used to buy 10 tubers of yam for, let's say, 6,000. Now, because of the increase in the price of petrol, the farmers will say, now, okay, I'm not going to sell it for 6,000 any longer. I'm going to sell the 10 tubers for 8,000. Hmm. You know, and the person who buys from the farmer will now transport to Abuja, you know, and, and add his own profit to it. So, That's what is happening. So, Doctor, we are uh, riders to this story saying uh, the prices is now beyond their reach. We even have a rider there where women in Taraba are protesting because yes. of the hike in food mm -hmm. items. Now, when you put aside by side the fact that the federal government is going to start paying 8,000 naira to about 12 million households mm -hmm. uh, for uh, six months, is that going to help in any way? I mean, 8,000 naira is, is, um, is, is, is too insignificant for what we are talking about. 8,000 naira cannot buy you a bag of rice. It can't, it can't even buy you a bag of gari, which is locally produced. It can't give you, I, I think, a, a model of uh, melon 
mudo of melon in Abuja market now is about 5,000. One mudo of melon. So if you use that 8,000 to buy a mudo of melon, for instance, you need to buy uh, uh, oil. You need to buy, I mean, uh, maggi to, for, your, for, your, for your meal. So uh, well, you see, I think we have rice going for a thousand and yes. two or a thousand. Uh, so if you, you can't even buy, so you can't. You, I mean, you, you can't do much with that. And I'm thinking that government is distributing that eight a thousand because maybe that is those are the terms and conditions that they got from is it the World Bank that gave the money? They say okay, give this money to I mean to uh, the vulnerable groups, and then uh, let, let them let, let it help them in their, in their in, in their in their daily survival, but then eight thousand to me is nothing. As far as surviving under this condition is concerned, is nothing. And you see, my own concern is this: when you when you are coming up with policies like removing subsidy, when you are coming up with policies like taking all the loans that the previous government took, which is taking about ninety nine percent of the revenue, there must be long term plan. You know. You see, if the, you see, you don't just take a decision, you know, because you feel subsidy, people are stealing subsidy money, yes, let's remove subsidy. It's not enough. But you have to talk about what are the implications. Then you ask, okay, what do we do? Is it right to remove subsidy? Can't we go after these guys who are stealing the money? You see, you say you have, you have the data of everyone who has been getting money from, I mean, from in, in all these transactions in Nigeria. You have the, you have, you have the doc, I mean, you have the, you have the data. You know who is getting what. You know what people have in their accounts. If you know that some persons got money that they don't deserve, you, have, you use EFCC to investigate and get this money back. But you don't say, oh, I'm punishing all Nigerians and removing subsidy because some persons are stealing, which is not the right thing to do. So there was no deep thinking. There was no plan in any, in, in any way. The 8,000 naira from the World Bank is not, a, is not part of, it's not a plan that can cushion the effect of what we are talking about. What we are look, you see, people, if people cannot eat, I mean, food is basic. For transportation, I mean, say, I'm not driving my car, I will trek. Then the medical people say, oh, it will improve your health. So, you understand? Yes. But food is, is necessary. So, doctor, where, where should the government instead channel this $800 million uh, dollars in such a way that it will have a much more impact on the generality of the people. Now, what my concern is that if that money that we got from the uh, World Bank was meant for a specific purpose, then you cannot divert it. For instance, if the World Bank says, okay, this money, because the World Bank has its own policies, they have their own uh, thematic preoccupation, want to reach the poor, I mean, the very poor in the society. And we have discovered that this very poor in society, about 12 million in Nigeria, they cannot afford anything to do. So we are giving you this loan to reach them. Now, if that is the condition under which this money was given, then you cannot divide that money for other purposes because you must use the money for the purpose for which it was meant. All right, side you know, by side. The, me the method then should come to question now as to how to do it in mm. a way that the it, people intended, uh, you know, to get this actually mm. get it. That's one of the debates. No, it's, it's an issue because I the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs am handling this. And there are a lot of issues about how a transparency of the process, for instance. For, I know in my own community, my, the village where I come from, in, in Kogi State, none of them has accepted this money. I mean, none of them are very, very poor. You know, if you get to this community and give somebody a thousand naira, for instance, the person will say, thank you, God bless you, pray for you. But none of them has benefited from uh, these uh, palliatives that they are talking about. Now, even, even the uh, Anko Broa's uh, scheme, it didn't affect anybody in my place. You know, there was a time, the calling from the village, they said, oh, say we should open bank accounts. They opened bank accounts, deposited some money, they couldn't withdraw the money, and nothing came. So, you see, the transparency in the process is an issue. We don't know how uh, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs got the data to say, oh, these are the ones who benefit, and these are the ones who should not benefit. At times we are told they come from traditional rulers. At times they are, they are, we are told they come from politicians. The politicians will give them a list that, oh, these are the people to benefit. And there were, there were times we heard politicians coming to declare on television that they gave a list. And the people, I mean, who were supposed to benefit did not benefit. So a whole lot of things, you know, are involved. So, I mean, the distribution has to be transparent. But then we know that government must not depend on World Bank alone. 
to I mean to sort out the problem. Okay, aside from the okay, uh, aside from the World Bank, the mm. government also has made a request of five hundred billion naira loan, mm. which the National Assembly has passed. Mm. Now the thing is. When he was asking for, no, 500 billion naira for palliatives. Mm. When he was asking for that, he didn't say exactly what form or format or what this palliative is going to look like. Mm. So what areas do you think this 500 billion should go to in such a way that Nigerians can actually feel that something is being done to ameliorate the suffering? Now, if you look at um, uh, the, uh, the inflation, one of the causes of inflation is the cost of transportation. You know, I've said it, that look, one of the things that government needs to do is to ensure that, look, people can move from place to place, can move their goods from place to place at a cheaper rate. Now, if I can get um, a bus that will take me from my house, maybe not from, my, from the bus stop clear, nearest to my house, to the office, I may not need to drive a car. If there is a metro, a rail system, you know, within the city that can move me from one place to another, I will not need to drive. If there is a process of transporting goods from rural areas, you know, to markets, you know, at a cheap rate. Well, right now, even rural farmers, they, they use uh, trucks, you know, and these trucks are commercial trucks. You know, the prices are, I mean, what they pay are commercial rates. So, I mean, it's high. If, they, if, if transportation is taken care of, you know, some things will have to settle, okay. you know, then... We, we talk about security also. I think the people, those who discuss the, um, the uh, food security, the food security they also talk about it. Mm. You see, we, we, the, uh, the, so most of the food that we eat is produced by, uh, what do you call it, peasant farmers, not commercial farmers. And this will need to be secure. Now, if they have security and they can produce more, the law of diminution return, will, will, I mean, the, the law of uh, demand and supply will come into play. That means that the higher the quantity, the more the quantity available, the price will collapse. Okay. So, okay, it, doctor, uh, because of time, uh, I, would, I would like for us to touch on also the issue of uh, the sit at home order. Uh, you know, in Enugu State, we understand that the state government has threatened to revoke license of traders uh, who are observing the sit at home order. What's your thought? I think uh, the problem we have in the Southeast uh, is linked to the fact that government has not demonstrated the capacity to secure the people. Now, I think there was a video that I watched. I don't know whether I mean, it was a real uh, uh, incident where some persons who defied Sitatu were shot. You understand? Now, if there's no security for the people who go to the market, to their market to sell uh, they are good. If, there, if there is no security for them, then you cannot compel them to enter into the market and put their lives at risk. That is number one. Then secondly, you see, the society may have a kind of sentiment. One, some of them will say, okay, we do observe this because somebody is passing through uh, what he should not pass through. So there has to be a lot of things, I mean, uh, there has to be a lot of things done simultaneously. One, there must be security. Secondly, there must be transparency in the trial of uh, Namdi Kanu, for which a lot of them claim to be doing uh, sit at home. You know, if we keep hearing that he cannot appear, or he's granted bail, the bail is not, uh, uh, is not um, actualized, if the system is seen not to be transparent, the, ju the, the justice system is seen not to be transparent, it will encourage you to say, okay, this man is being persecuted. Mm. And that is, that, is the, that is the danger of what is being done now. Mm. You see, the, in, the, in, the, in the Southeast, mm. you know, there is this impression that Unami Khan is being persecuted. Okay, but, you know? but from what it appears now, it looks like even the IPOP is factionalized now. Uh, because in one breath we hear him how powerful the spokesman of IPOP say, well, the IPOP is disassociating itself uh, mm. from the sit at home orders. In, in another breath, we hear another man from Finland who keep giving orders and, you know, it appears like those orders are being carried out uh, here in Nigeria. So in terms of engaging the Finland government, say, for instance, the Nigerian government uh, engaging the Finland government with respect to this uh, particular gentleman, uh, what have we done in that regard? Well, I think um, there, there was a time that uh, Emmanuel, this Simon Ekwaba, yes. she was invited by the authorities in Finland, and he was investigated. And, um, and they said, well, he was not breaching their own uh, their law. 
you know, so they released him and he continued to do what he's, what he's doing in the name of freedom. Now, but my own concern is that, you see, we, are, we shouldn't be talking about Finland. We're talking about Nigeria. You know, if there's security, if there's presence of security men enough to secure the people, they will go to the market. But if the government is not serious, if the government statements are not reliable, you know, you say you are revoking licenses. Well, you can revoke my license so that I can leave. Well, there are, there are lots of people who have responded to that, especially on social media, saying that, okay, fine. Uh, instead of saying this, the governments of the South East, all the governors should come together and look for a lasting solution yes. to this, instead of throwing this to the people, because it appears as if this is what the governor of Enugu State is doing. Of course. You see, we, we, there must be a deliberate attempt. If the whole of the South East, they can come together and say, look, this is about the South East. The economy of the South East is affected. I don't think any right-thinking business will go and set up business in the South East now, because of the insecurity there. Even if there's I mean, apart from the insecurity, you see, the fact is that when you produce, you can't sell. Because you don't have money. Talk to those in the Southeast. They will tell you, there's no money because we are not doing business. So it's not in the interest of the people of the Southeast for this sit at home to continue, for this security to continue. And for all the, so if the Southeast governors and political, they need to come together and say, look, there must be a solution. I mean, to but this. what can they do differently? They have this coming together, we've seen it in the past, and it led to what they call the Abubayagu. Uh, arrangement that mm. we still cannot understand how they operate uh, till today. At least in the case of the Amoteco of the Southwest, we've seen brand, they, we've seen them, uh, you know, branded. We've seen them with their uniforms. We've seen the governors uh, bring money together, purchase uh, vehicles for them, and we've mm. seen their, you know, advocacy for them to be armed and the rest. Mm. But in the case of the Ebubaya, we have not, we are not really hearing that much. Instead, we hear you know allegations and counter allegations uh the residents in in some of the states accusing Ebubeagu of killing people and the rest and uh, some kind of mm. politicization of the, of the now the, the fact is that you see if you do things in a manner that people don't believe you then it cannot succeed you see there has to be sincerity of purpose if you look at what are some in the southeast you see the, the there is more of politics you know and the leaders want to belong you know, they, some want to belong to uh, whatever we call the center. And so whatever they will do, they look at the thinking of the people who are running the system in Nigeria, the center, and work along that line. Now, there are some who say, okay, we want to be seen to be pro Igbo. And so they, you see them, I mean, not opening their lips, you know, widely when they condemn IPO. You see, if what Ibo is doing is criminal, and I think to a great extent there's a lot of criminality going there, the people of the Ibo land must come out openly to say, we disagree with you. But if they don't come out to openly say they disagree with Ibo, and they, and they keep I mean, being neither here nor there, you know, the system will continue in the way it is, and people will continue to, to get killed. Okay. So there has to be a sincerity of purpose. Like you said, mm -hmm. they must come together and say, okay, how do we deal with this matter? Sincerely, uh, and it's possible. Okay, you know, if they are sincere about uh, their own, they are pushed to it. All right, thank you so much, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Teoflos Abba, is the director of Daily Trust Foundation, uh, giving us analysis and perspectives on the stories on the front pages of our newspapers this morning. We look forward to having you again, as always. Mm, thank you. All right, well, that's our show for today. In case you've missed, you can always catch up across all our social media platforms and also on our YouTube live stream. I am. Ayuba, Ila, thanks for watching. Thank you for welcoming us into your homes this morning. Join us same time, same station tomorrow. My name is Stella Iaji, and for now, have a pleasant day.